Thank you very much for inviting me and coming to hear me talk. Let me just show a very small example. This is something produced by an Australian friend of mine, Ross Moore, and it shows how perhaps computers might be used to do mathematics, to manipulate, to manipulate mathematics. So here is a formula which you probably all know. What is perhaps more surprising... X equals minus B plus or minus square root of B squared minus 4 times I times C all over 2 times I. And when you heard it speak it, notice it was saying 2 times A, even though there is no time symbol here. It was saying B squared and so on. I was playing another more complicated example earlier. So when I talk about computers uh, manipulating mathematics, I want to think of things like this as one of the examples. So, as I said, that was due to an Australian friend of mine. Many people have contributed to this talk, so I thank them all. I uh, would we'll probably actually do that, couldn't I, yes. So, I should point out I've read very little, not zero, but very little Hungarian mathematics, and I don't know about the specificities of Hungarian notation, if there are many. I have taught in... Uh, United Kingdom, in France, and in North America, so I've met a few specificities of notation. Also, this is a very brief introduction to the subject. I did actually, when I was at school, we actually had a printing press, and I actually set the mathematics exam papers. So if you think of those very old pictures of people standing there picking up bits of metal and putting them in to make typesetting 50 years ago, I have been there. So I know a bit about how mathematics used to be done, which still affects how we do mathematics today. And I have been involved in various efforts, open math and MathML. And then also something I can't write down, but I will tell you, I actually have a blind research student and I have had to teach to blind students. And one of my research students actually manages the university service for students with this sort of disability. So I have come across these problems. So what I want to talk about first is mathematical notation and perhaps some of its flaws. I'll talk about how it is currently displayed and represented, which means talk about MathML and OpenMath. And I'll talk about how it might be understood. The, but that's not a very good description because these subjects do overlap. So the outsider's perception of notation is that it, mathematical notation is unambiguous, unchanging, precise, worldwide, or more so, and so on. So I don't know about exact Hungarian, but in many languages people say it's as obvious as 2 plus 2 equals 4. And indeed, if you Google the phrase mathematically precise, you will find it used in all sorts of contexts, not just in mathematics. You know, people use it in ordinary speech. Uh, there are various science fiction stories where people convince aliens they are intelligent by drawing Pythagoras' theorem and so on. Uh, and in real life, I certainly, I think, think many of you will have seen two mathematicians who speak no language sit down with a piece of paper and discuss mathematics. That happens. I've seen it. Um, my father and a Russian mathematician and many others like that. It happens. It is a language. Um, and there's an entire computing discipline of formal mathematics which tries to reduce computer programming to mathematics and logic. So there is quite a lot of truth in the outsider's perception. Quite a lot of truth, not 100% true. So it's certainly not unchanging. The plus sign is actually less than 500 years old. Uh, Stevelius in uh, 1544 introduced that, and the plus sign and, and the minus sign and the square root sign. What's interesting is that the equal sign is somewhat, is somewhat younger, about, about uh, 30 years, uh, no, 13 years younger. Uh, it, it was actually a Cambridge mathematician 
and Cambridge is working out how to celebrate the 500th birthday of equal sign. Uh, now, record who wrote that, record who wrote that, he wrote for two times a plus b, he put a line over the a and the b. That was the first notation. Brackets came later. And brackets won. People, people no longer use this notation. People always use brackets. Why? Because brackets are much easier to typeset. You pick up an open bracket and you put it in the right place, pick up a closed bracket. If you want to typeset this notation, you have to take a straight line, cut it with, it's in lead, so you cut it to the right length and so on. Much harder. So this is an example of the technology driving the notation. Calculus had, and D still has, two notations. They were in bitter conflict. They're now in armed truce for differentiation. Relativity introduced, uh, I was, it was uh, 1916, Einstein introduced the summation convention. Instead of writing that, he just wrote CIXI, and you're meant to sum it. Except that, if you use the Greek letter here, you are meant to start at naught, not one. That's Einstein. And indeed, practically every mathematician introduces some notation. And there's a sort of natural selection here, really. Some people's notation is remembered and some people's isn't. It's a growing subject, in fact. It's not fixed. It's not quite so international, either. If you want the interval from naught, not including naught, to one, including one, the Englishman or the North American writes it with a round bracket and a square bracket. The Frenchman writes it with square brackets, but like that. And Germans, I've seen Germans do both. The Englishman writes arctangent with a small a for the function that's well-defined, and with a capital A for the multi-valued function. The Frenchman does exactly the same, but the opposite way around. For the numbers 0, 1, 2, dot, 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 the English and the French write N, the Germans tend to write N union zero. Because for the numbers starting at one, the English and the French have to write N but not zero, and the Germans just write N. Their definition of N is starts at one, in general, and so on. So there are international differences. And it's not quite so universal. Most people think the square root of minus one is i, but electrical engineers think of it as j. And in fact, the MATLAB computer algebra system will allow you to use both. And in fact, these problems start at quite an early age in our schooling. Here is an example of a sheet issued to American middle school teachers to explain to them that immigrants from Mexico do long division differently. Not better, not worse, but differently. So format one, e, unlike, I've never seen a square root here. I've seen this one, certainly. And format two is much more the Latin American way. So here we have a sheet issued by the Houston County Department of Education to illustrate to teachers that immigrants might divide differently. So this is sort of children aged 8, 10, that sort of age. But in fact, it's more complicated than that. Uh, the math and math community know of 10 different definitions of division. There are 10 different definitions of long division that can be laid out there. And uh, the website reference points you at them. And of course, if you're teaching a class where the children come from different, different histories, then the ability to use the same piece of mathematics, have it printed differently, is really very useful. Okay. And within mathematics, it's certainly very specific to which area you are. So for example, that construction, 
which I won't tell you what it, what it is, could be the ordered pair, first two and then four, which might be in geometry the point x equals 2, y equals 4, or the vector 2, 4, or the open interval from 2 to 4 in English notation, or in group theory the transposition that swaps 2 and 4, and so on. And in number theory, it might be the greatest common divisor of 2 and 4. And I'm sure there are many others, but that will do to give you an example. And the other point is, this is why I didn't tell you, these are actually spoken differently. If I was doing group theory, I would say the transposition 2, 4. If I was doing geometry, I would say the point 2, 4. So if I write that text, I read it as we draw a line from the point 2, 4 to the point 3, 5. which makes text-to-speech very difficult for advanced mathematics. My student who runs the service in Bath says that she cannot send a, a speaker to a mathematics course if the speaker is not, to help another student if that speaker has not done the same mathematics course because the speaker will not understand the notation. And here's a good example. Consider this phrase here. I have the same symbol here and here. The same symbol. But if I read it, how do, you, how do we read it? H sub i is a subgroup of G for i less than or equal to n. We read the two occurrences. We read that as is a subgroup of. And we read that as less than in the same sentence. And those of you who are group theorists were not at all surprised by that sentence. It's a perfectly standard sentence. Ah, oh dear. The other point is our notation is not perfect. Uh, it's co normally called Landau. He actually borrowed it from Buckman. But the Landau notation, as it's called, is very common. And it's really good. We define big O of f of n to be the set of all functions which have a certain growth property. And it's very convenient. It's used a lot, not only in, math, in analysis, but also in computer science, the study of algorithms, and so on. Many students learn it. And we've got other concepts, big omega, big theta, and so on. So far, so good. The big mistake is to use the equal sign. We write n is big O of n squared. We use the equal sign here. And that's a mistake. We should use set membership. The function n is one of the functions with that property. And generally speaking, if we say it, if we read that, I say in English, n is big O of n squared. I don't say n equals big O of n squared. This is, and this point is, this isn't the traditional use of equals. If a equals b, b equals a. But if n is big O of n squared, I can't write big O of n squared equals n. Back in Bath, I actually teach the course in which this is introduced to students, and every year it causes me grief and I have to explain it. I don't like explaining it, because it's not logical. Uh, and because it's not thought of this way, many books struggle over capital theta, whereas if you think of the set theory, Capital theta is the intersection of big O and big omega. As simple as that. There is one book by Levitin. It's the only book I know which is completely correct and uses set membership throughout. But every other book I've met misuses the equal sign in this context. And that's a problem for our students. It's a problem I face every year. I have to explain to students, I'm sorry, I'm going to tell you a piece of bad notation, but it's history. Another one is, it's quite good, we write sine of x squared. I square x, then I apply sine. That's obvious. I write sine of x, all squared, apply sine to x, then square the result. I can also write sine of sine of x. Apply sine, and then apply it again. What about this? This is generally used 
So with the square here, it's generally used to mean the square of sine x. Despite the fact that many years ago, Babbage, the famous one of the earliest computer scientists, he also wrote a very good article on notation who said, this is by far the most objectionable of any. And we carry on doing it. If anything, this should mean sine of sine of x, because that's what we do in general if we, apply, if we apply permutations or transpositions in group theory and so on. And furthermore, if I write sine minus 1 of x, I don't mean 1 over sine x. I mean the inverse function of sine x. So that is, in fact, minus 1 in the same sense as that is 2. So our notation is inconsistent, and it's inconsistent between sine squared and sine minus 1. That minus 1 and that 2 mean totally different things. And it's inconsistent what we do elsewhere in group theory and so on. Why do we do it? Because lazy printers found it easier. They didn't have to reach for those brackets. That's all it is. It's laziness by our ancestors have led us with, led us with that. Again, confusing notation. So here's a little example of mathematical notation. We're from, the the from number theory, from continued fractions. Pi is 3 plus 1 over, well, not quite 7, but a bit more, 7 plus 1 over, 15 plus 1 over, and so on. That explains why 3 and a 7th is quite a good approximation to pi, and why 355 over 113 is an even better approximation, and so on. Now, I say that, but it's normally written in most textbooks like this. Most books show you one of these, then say, in future, we'll write it this way. Uh, and there are two reasons for that. The first is that it actually uses less paper. And the second is it's much easier to typeset. If you give one of these to an old-fashioned printer, he will, he, will, he will be very upset because he's got to find four different sizes of numbers. He has the first two in front of him. The third and the fourth are physically in different boxes. He has to get up from his chair, walk across the room, and find the other sizes of numbers. I've done that. And that's why you don't like that, and that's why we write it that way, even though it's not correct, as it were. This is correct, and that's sort of a funny way of indicating it by putting the plus signs here, because it's easier. Now, notice again that this plus sign is lined up with this middle bar, of course, because it's really a fraction. And my formula descends down like this. Notice that. OK. Yes. So how might a computer display mathematical notation on the screen? Historically, it was some kind of image, just a picture. And until really fairly recently, that's all you got was pictures, basically, pictures of equations. When it came to typesetting, there were many attempts. And then in the late 1970s, early 1980s, the computer scientist Don Knuth uh, was so upset by the printing, by the old technology, of the new edition of his book, he said, I can do better. And he wrote the tech typesetting system. These days, most people don't use tech, they use LaTeX, which is a derivative of tech, but which used exactly the same typesetting engine because Knuth understood typesetting better than anyone else, basically. And there are some fantastic rules in there to get it looking the way we're used to seeing it. And that's typesetting as I'm using for these slides and for the example I showed you earlier and so on. How about web pages? Web pages were stuck with GIFs or JPEGs until, oh, sorry, sorry. So the main principle of Knuth was that it, your form was made of boxes, and each box had width and height and depth. And if you remember this one, you can see that this formula goes down here but all that component has to be aligned with the plus sign. 
it's important to have the idea of a depth going down here. Otherwise, you can't, whoops, you can't align it properly. So the principle was boxes with width and height and depth. And then, and depth is vital to show those continued fractions. You can't just line them up, line up the boxes. You have to line them up correctly. And since 1998, at least in theory, MathML was a World Wide Web Consortium standard for presenting mathematics on the web. 1998 is quite a long time ago now, really. But the problem was that browsers did not have depth. They had width and height, but not depth. And in fact, that was a, that's still a problem. And for example, the Chrome browser depends on which release you get. Sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't support MathML, depending on exactly what the person who made the latest version felt like. Because depth is a big extra piece of software. If you think there's a bug in depth, it doesn't get included. Then the math act doesn't work. And the other problem is that the range of fonts required uh, is often inadequate or non-standard and depends on your browser and so on. And this is a real problem. Enter a, a piece of software called MathJax produced by the MathJax Consortium, which is many people, but largely a joint effort between the American Math Society and the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, which is a wonderful solution. It runs on your web browser and tries to do the best possible job. It really has made looking at mathematics on the web from MathJax supported sites and so on, like mathematical reviews and many journals and so on, much better. I say it's a very pragmatic solution. A, a professional software engineer would, would run screaming and say, you can't do it that way, but this way works in practice. I should point out that a major challenge is line breaking. How should a mathematical expression be broken across multiple lines? If we look at this one, for example, the line breaking here is deeply semantic. Each equation belongs on a new line. You can't fit this into fewer lines, really, unless you totally ignore the semantics. Tech and LaTeX provide no support for breaking displayed equations and very little support, really, for inline equations. I quite often write papers which have to be in one format, and then the journal wants a different format. Uh, in particular, some of the conferences I go to want it in two-column format, where the columns are quite narrow. And every time I do that, re-breaking the equations is a significant effort to get the equations to look right. But that's the author. Now, the problem with a web page is that the author has no control over the screen size of the browser. I'm writing a web page, and you might be using a desktop machine, or an iPad, or an iPhone, or something else totally different. I have no control. So therefore, the browser has to do the line breaking. The author can give hints, and the MathML standard provides some suggestions, but this is an unsolved problem. And it's a major problem when it comes to electronic books. Uh, well, I, I read a lot of studies about electronic books and so on, and then when you look at the details of them, you find they are nearly always being done in humanities courses or social sciences courses. There are very few studies on e-books in mathematics because there aren't, there aren't that many good e-books in mathematics, simply because of the problem of, of, of line breaking and so on uh, with the equations. It's not a, it's not a solved problem. Uh, EPUB 3.0 is meant to be better than EPUB 2.0, but it's still not perfect. Um, there's an interesting challenge. 
So I've mentioned MathML. MathML is a World Wide Web standard. It actually comes it were, in two parts. The first part I want to talk about is what's called MathML presentation, which, as it were, describes how a formula looks. It's used to describe the layout structure of, my math of mathematical notation. So f of x, in, in, in Clouse tech, you just write f of x like that, f brackets, x brackets, and it prints notice with the italic letters and so on. So the best MathML for it is you say it's a row. MathML, as I said, is XML, so XML, you begin like that and you end like that. It's got the mathematical identifier f. It's got the mathematical operator apply function, which actually corresponds to that space here, f of x, if I read it. So when I read it, I actually, I don't read the, I don't read f open brackets, x close brackets. Do you? Does anyone here read that to uh, students? No, you read f of x or whatever the Hungarian is, which I don't know, I'm sorry. Um, and then you've got another, a, a, a subsidiary row which says brackets, x brackets. And notice from this, it's precisely clear what the argument of f is. That matters for line breaking and for speech rendering. So we, as I said, we want to say f of x and for finding the meaning. It is, however, presentation. It's good, it tells you how it looks like. It's what you will see if you go to uh, most pages, most web pages these days, will be MathML being displayed by means of MathJax. So MathJax reads the MathML and does the best it can on that particular browser, etc. And I would argue, in fact, it's largely about written presentation. MathML to speech is better than the previous things, and it pretty much works what the Americans call K-12, kindergarten to 12th grade, i.e. school mathematics. However, this object, which is open brackets, two, comma, four, close brackets, will still be spoken like that, and is just as ambiguous as it was when I put it up earlier. Because in fact, this big piece of MathML has no more meaning than that. It doesn't tell you whether I mean a GCD or an interval or anything else. To ask what mathematics means, we need the other part of MathML standard, known as MathML content, which is described as an explicit encoding of the underlying mathematical meaning of an expression rather than any particular rendering of the expression. So it's meant to say what it means, not what it looks like or sounds like or whatever. But as I've already said, the difference between looks like and sounds like is actually quite big. So consider that an expression. It could be multiplication take f plus g and multiply it by x, or it could be take the function which is made from f and g and apply that function to x. You can't tell the difference from looking at it. So if it's multiplication, we apply the times operator to the result of applying the plus operator to f and g and all that gets applied to x. CI is a mathematical content identifier. The identifier f, the identifier g, the identifier x. On the other hand, if we mean function application, we apply, not times, but we actually apply f plus g to x. So those expressions are subtly, but importantly different. That's multiplication, that's function application. And it has to be that way. We don't need brackets because the apply does all the grouping for us and the meaning is explicit because we either have or don't have a times. Okay. So here, 
I have two different content expressions which would probably generate the same ink. Well, they do generate, they both generate that. But they're different. Now, I need to make a slight digression into the topic of open math. Open math started life rather differently. It grew out of the computer, algebra, the computer algebra community where people were fed up with having large expressions. I have a large expression in my system. I want to apply your system to it. Oh my God, I've got to rewrite it by hand. And people had any number of edit scripts that did the conversions and so on. And sometimes they worked and sometimes they didn't. And wouldn't it be nice if we had an exchange language? And people actually used the phrase in Esperanto of mathematics, a way we could all talk the same expression. What you do in your system is up to you, but you must talk this common language. And then extensibility becomes the key. And in fact, we took extensibility almost as far as you can go in open math. There are basic objects, there are integers, there are floating point numbers, there are strings, there are byte arrays, which are there for odd purposes, there's mathematical variables, and what we call symbols. And then, you, from these basic objects, you can use OMA, which is rather like the apply I saw earlier, the concept of function application. I emphasize the concept. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean you have to compute this function. It talks about the concept of applying a function. OM Atra lets you specify the attributes of an object, like I want this to be in Gothic or in Greek or whatever. OM Bind introduces the concept of binding, be it a, a computer scientist lambda expression, or sum over i, or a quantifier, or an integral, or something. OM error gives you error objects. And everything else is built from that. I've given you, in half a slide, the entire grammar of open math. So even addition is just a symbol, just an OMS, like this. So how, where do these symbols belong? Because if addition is just a symbol, it's not built in, how do I do it? A symbol, or in general several symbols, is defined in what we call a content dictionary, which lists the symbols and their meaning, either formally or informally. I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. So the addition operator is the open math symbol whose name is plus, and comes from the content dictionary RF1. The open math symbol times from RF1 is the multiplication operator. The open math symbol times from RF2 is in fact non-commutative multiplication. A times B is not necessarily B times A if you use this times. So we can tell from the open math, which times you mean, which is uh, not common. And how often have you seen particularly students struggling when they don't realize it's non-commutative and so on? A good example would be log from the transcendental function is the complex logarithm. Now, as some of you will know, the complex logarithm is not very well defined. In order to define, you have to say where you want to cut the complex plane and we state where the branch cut is to be, and we follow the, by now, standard uh, Bramwitz and Stegen or the online table of mathematical functions on. And that's an informal specification. That's, in fact, the only informal specification there because if I take another function, like arctan, the inverse tangent, we don't write tan to the minus one because of the problem of, of, I mentioned earlier. This is given with a formal specification written in open math itself saying exactly how this function relates to that one. So in fact, there's only one informal specification. Where does log have its cut? 
and all the rest are formally related to it. And indeed, I have a student working on a system that uses that to translate expressions. And anyone can write a content dictionary, private, two people, just two pieces, or one person with two systems, writes a content dictionary, uses it, that's fine. Or you can be experimental, uh, and there are a lot of those, or indeed it can be official. And one of my jobs in the Open Mouth Society is I, in fact, run the process by which we get referees reports and so on, and the CD becomes official, provided the referees agree that it's unambiguous and sufficiently useful and so on. But it's not fixed. Okay, so that's a digression into open math, which is important because when I come back to content math ML, how did this happen? When W3C was first producing XML, back 20 years ago or so, the first thing they said is we must have mathematics. Tim Berners-Lee himself said that the thing he never got finished in HTML was doing mathematics properly. Tim Berners-Lee is a physicist, of course. He needs mathematics. He just couldn't quite get it right. He now knows why he couldn't get it right. It's quite hard. But, uh, and MathML was actually the first XML application. MathML 1.0 in 1998, aimed to do kindergarten to 12, K-12 uh, mathematics, and had about 90 elements. And then people said, well, that's not quite enough. I want to teach my first year undergraduates and so on. MathML 2.0, a couple of years later, had rather more calculus in it. It had 127 elements. You can see this going on, can't you? So MathML 2.0, second edition, said, aha, we're not going to carry on like this. What we'll let you do is, if you want something that's not in MathML, you can extend it via OpenMath. Because OpenMath, as I've just explained to you, is this infinitely extensible system. And in fact, MathML 3.0 actually said, that is the answer. We will essentially go on the content side, we'll have full interoperability with OpenMath. You can see it took seven years. There's quite a lot of anguish in those seven years. Um, I was involved in it. And 3.0 second edition, which is due out real soon now, as they say in the trade, um, has some bug fixes and more explanations and so on. So now it is the case that you can, ex you can write any mathematics uh, in content math ML because you can write a content dictionary. So if you and your friend have a new piece of mathematics, you write your content dictionary and it can be explained. And with that content dictionary, you put rules for how to, do, how to convert it into ink or pixels or sound, whatever else you want to do. And so times, I showed you on the previous slide, is really now just a shorthand for the times from RF1. So all these 127 elements are now just shorthand for open math objects. We had to do some work in open math to make that possible, but it's now the case that MathML is extensible as far as one wants it to be. And at the open math workshop this summer, and do come to the conference, I couldn't get, I couldn't get one plug in, uh, do come to our conference, we're going to talk about closer integration still. There's a few unfinished things on the open math side. Okay. So that's sort of how our computers can represent mathematics. How might they understand written mathematics? If I have a piece of mathematics like that, and if all I have is that, I have ink or I have a, 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 a for example, if I, if I scan that, if I have that, how might a computer understand it? Well, computers understand lots of things. The technical term for this is parsing. And parsing has been um, understood, well, it was introduced well, actually in, 19, in the very early 1960s. People started having theories of parsing. 
Uh, general theories of parsing go back pretty much 50 years. They're papers, books, it's something. I don't know what they do here, what you do here, but uh, we teach our second year computer science students how to do it. Uh, and there are lots of tools, Flex, Bison, to help you do it, and so on. Very easy. You, know, you invent a formal language, you reach for these tools, you write a grammar, and the parsing is done for you. It's a solved problem. Two-dimensional parsing? There's little literature. The best literature is a 1968 PhD thesis, which shows you it's not, it hasn't moved very much. There are no known tools for doing it. And in fact, it's not even clear what the specification would be. So what is the specification of that? Uh, well, I've got an integral sign, and then I've got another integral sign, which is... Uh, seven pixels to the right of it. Well, the bottom left-hand corner is seven pixels to the left or right of it, and it's the same size. What do I mean by size? You know, it's no longer a case of interpreting a set of characters on a line. It's not even clear what the specification is. So, uh, how are you going to even describe the input? Not clear. There are a few packages around. There's one for revert, there's several, there are a couple for reverse engineering PDFs, which will take a PDF such as I have, like that, where the PDF was produced by a tool, not by scanning, and will reverse engineer that to produce some mathematics. The uh, BSS 12, that's quite good. You give it a PDF produced by LaTeX, it will spit out some LaTeX, but it's a pretty good approximation to it. So it does that, which is wonderful or terrible, depending whether you're afraid of plagiarists, and so on, and so on. There's also work on handwritten mathematics. Uh, there's quite a big a community working on this. I've just given you one reference here. But generally, these are massive heuristics. There's often quite a lot of machine learning involved. Um, Suzuki here has a big database of tables where he got students to type in the meaning and he ran it through his recognizer and so on. It's a very artificial intelligence-ish subject. Unlike ordinary parsing, which stopped being artificial intelligence 50 years ago and just became a solved problem. 2D parsing, very different. Actually, even the 1D parsing of mathematics is hard. If I've got two letters next to each other, what does that mean? Yeah. If you can't solve that problem, what can you solve? Let's look at this problem. So what do two letters mean? It might mean number formation. If I've got a two followed by a three, I mean number 23. Or word formation. You know, just like any programming language. So far, so good. Or it might mean function application. S-I-N-X. Which, of course, in MathML properly would be the apply function, which you can't see. That's just S-I-N-X, isn't it? A slight clue is given by the fact that that's an N in Roman font and that's an X in Italic font, if you read carefully. Or it might be multiplication. Or it might be concatenation. M sub IJ means the, uh, means the I comma J element of a matrix. It doesn't mean the element whose index is I times J. And that's where MathML has the invisible comma operation. Or it might even mean addition. I'm actually responsible for introducing this into MathML. They said there is no invisible addition, and I wrote that on the back of the conference program, and they said, oh dear. And there are technical reasons why this isn't invisible plus. 
uh, but that's lost in the midst of Unicode. I won't go into that argument. So we don't even know what putting two things next to each other means. And I've actually looked at this problem and produced a table, which I don't, we have never seen before. So if we look at what's to the left and what's to the right, what are they? If they're both normal letters, then the meaning is lexical concatenation, as in sign. If they're both two ordinary Roman letters together in mathematics, mean you're forming a word. Normal followed by italic means application, like sign, the N followed by the X is application. Two italics is, normal, is multiplication, except when it's in the subscript, when it might well not be. Italic followed by normal is multiplication, A times sine X, that's a time sign. Digit followed by digit is normally lexical, but, well, that's probably the four two elements of a matrix, isn't it? Digit followed by italic is multiplication. Digit followed by normal is multiplication. Normal followed by digit is application. But notice 2 sine 3x. That multiplies the 3 by the x, then applies sine to both of them, then multiplies that by 2. So the ordinary rule that application binds, binds more tightly is just not true. Italic followed by a digit is an error. However, especially if you're doing handwriting, you want whether it's not x squared or x sub 2. So if you're doing handwriting, I know people who do this, when they see that, they, they have, their program has to go backwards and say, reconsider the baselines and wonder whether it's not really a baseline shift. A digit followed by a fraction is addition, as we saw. Italic followed by Greek is inverse application. So A phi, as in group theory, means phi of A normally, applying the operator phi to element A. And italic, oh dear, it's the bottom screen, sorry. Italic followed by an open bracket is really unclear. F open brackets x plus y is probably a function. As so f open brackets y plus a is probably a function. X open brackets y plus a is probably multiplication. And that table, which I've not seen elsewhere, I mean, there's nothing surprising in any line here. But I've never actually seen it written down before, all in one place. Which is why I said explained in inverted commas, because notice there's some, there's some gray areas here. So, what are the consequences of this? Compare sine x, which I got out of, out of Knuth's excellent tape by typing backslash sine x, which is how you should do it. Notice there's a small space here. Here, I cheated with tech. I, I just told it what to do, rather than it doesn't put a space here. That small space is vital in understanding mathematics. It may not seem so, but you try producing mathematics without it, and it will look unreadable. The trained eye is very sensitive to these differences of spacing. Note also that the font drives the meaning of juxtaposition, as I showed you that table on the previous page. And one consequence of this is that this, as it were, justifies an experimental fact that was measured some years ago, which is if you're doing, if you've got mathematics on paper and you want to digitize it and so on, you need to do high precision digitization. You need at least 400 dots per inch. I'm sorry, but that's how we talk in digitization terms, even though computing is normally metric. Preferably 600, whereas ordinary text is fine at 300 because you need that resolution to pick up the difference in fonts. If you can't tell whether it's Italic or Roman, you don't understand what having the two letters next to other means. That's why you need such resolution in digitizing. The standard rule where all variables are equal, known as alpha conversion science, just isn't true in practice. 
We say it, it doesn't matter what variable names you use, but it does, isn't true. F of y plus, that's, that first one is clearly a function application, isn't it? The second one is clearly multiplication. Even though all I've done is use a different letter of the alphabet, and we all teach our students this doesn't matter. It does. And this is probably, however I say, there's no real theory here. Um, there was a very good theory 400 years ago. There was a, a very good convention which said that constants, constants were consonants and variables were vowels. We've lost that convention many years ago. And there's sort of a convention that x, y, z, and so on are variables, and f, g are functions, sort of. But it's a very weak convention. That's what drives your understanding of this, versus the, of, of, of this combination here. But it's a very weak convention. Uh, and this is, uh, there is, of course, I said at the start of my lecture, in relativistic summation, there's bizarre to the outside of convention that Roman letters sum from 1 to 3 and Greek letters sum from 0 to 3. But in general, there's no theory, which probably explains why there's so much artificial intelligence involved in these things. So we've come an awful long way from images. But these days, you can really see the mathematics um, my blind research student can have the mathematics spoken to him. He's actually also quite good at reading the LaTeX, but that's not a matter, but he can have it spoken to him and so on. However, there's still a long way to go. We are not very far along the road of computer learning, reading mathematics. As I said, we don't even have a good theory of what it means to have two letters next to each other. And the big unsolved problem is searching for formulae. You can Google, and Google is fantastic. You put in a phrase, it comes out. Can anyone try Googling for a formula? Just doesn't work, does it? If you don't know, if you know the formula but not the name of it, you can't look it up, can you? It's a big unsolved problem, and every year we have math search workshops and math search challenges to try to look into the problem of how on earth would you search for a formula? On that note, thank you.